there's a story in what's called the Midrash, which is sort of fan fiction of the Old Testament. The, the rabbis would sort of fill in the gaps of the stories. And there's a story where uh, Abraham is called to go to the land uh, other than his father's that God will show him. And the Midrash is that the night that Abraham gets the call from God, uh, he goes back and his father happens to own a shop that sells idols. And so Abraham goes in, he's had this experience with the living God, right? This one who said, hey, go to this other land. So he goes into his father's idol shop and he smashes up all the idols except for one. He puts the giant hammer in the hands of the one idol and he waits. And the next morning, his father comes into the shop and he says, what in the world has happened here? <laughs> what happened? And Abraham says, oh, well, the, you know, this, this one idol, he, he won. He smashed up all the other ones. And his father says, no, 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 these are, these are merely lifeless statues. And Abraham says, well, then why do you bow down and worship them? This is like the ancient Near Eastern version of a mic drop. <laughs> um, right? uh, and I think part of why Ricky Gervais's comedic reading of the Bible is so funny is that slow burn of the realization this kind of reading of the Bible is a stupid idol. It doesn't make any sense. It's nonsense. And I think as Aaron pointed out, both funny, but also can be dangerous. And Isaiah is making the same prophetic critique of idolatry in general, that we fashion these things, whether statues of iron or wood or the literal reading of the Bible. And then we worship our renderings, not what it actually is, but our renderings. And the same reason Abram gets the mic drop and his father, our idols are these lifeless renderings we've made, and then we bow down and worship them. In the Hebrew Bible, God is consistently portrayed as transcendent, of human understanding, invisible, unsearchable, unnameable, immutable, inaccessible, even inexpressible. Entire books of the Hebrew text have different people trying to make sense of God, and none of them can come up with a satisfactory explanation that fully grasps God. Idolatry is an effort to reduce God to something understandable. Idolatry is an effort to reduce something, God to something that's understandable. It can be understood to, to be any attempt that would render the essence of God accessible, visible, or objectified. Bringing God into aesthetic visibility, like the iron or wooden statue, like a book, that you can hold in your hand. So what if idolatry isn't just though about aesthetic visibility, but also about conceptual visibility, rendering God not just into like a wooden statue, but into a concept, such as a theological system or objective belief list or a view of God presented by a literal reading of the Bible, for example. A system of ideas or ideals where we locate God, where we nail God down, where we render God in this form. Like an aesthetic idol, like a wooden statue or an iron statue, the conceptual idol refers to any system of thought which the individual or the community takes to be an accurate rendering of God, in this case, a literally accurate rendering of God. The only significant difference between an aesthetic idol, like a golden calf, for example, and a conceptual idol lies in the fact that the former reduces God to a physical object, the latter reduces God to an intellectual object object, both of which can be seen, rendered, understood, apprehended. Very often, the Bible becomes this interesting mix of an aesthetic idol, the physical book, which becomes dangerously synonymous with God in many contexts, and at the same time, the literal reading, which regularly represents this conceptual idol of a singular right reading of the text by which God is clearly and directly revealed. Now, Brian McLaren does a, a fabulous job of reframing the understanding of the Bible, not as a legal constitution, like an airtight singular document with no internal disagreements, a singular source of inspiration and authorship, from which we can very much like lawyers, quote chapter and verse and precedent in order to prove our points. Instead, he says the Bible is a community library. It's the library of a community with the same questions about God, life, and meaning, but who over thousands of years come up with many different, diverse expressions of answers to those questions. It's full of internal debate. It's full of internal disagreement, like you would expect from a good library <laughs> worth its salt. It's full of the opinions of tons of people on the same subject. And maybe most importantly, the fact that it's a library and not a legal constitution means that it contains more than one type of literature, right? It's more than legal. 
it's more than literal. It's poetry and prose. It's myth and allegory. It's legal writing and love letters. It's comedy and tragedy. It's song and lament. It's letters and gospels. Often, the same book will contain many different types of literature. So what is it? (laughs) It is that same raw material and fashioned artwork, the same inspired human expression as the iron and wood that Isaiah speaks of, beautiful and valuable on its own, and in the same way, it is our posture towards it that makes it the idol, not the thing itself. It becomes an idol when we treat it like a legal constitution which reveals God or God's will directly, clearly, and precisely, with no room for interpretation, no room for mystery, no sense of ongoing inspiration, or the possibility that it is not closed, but it is actually open. And it is at its best when we let it breathe. When we assume that when we open the text, God is still speaking. It remains most valuable as that sacred work of art, that sacred inspired library and an inspired collection of art rather than like the Psalm 23 drawing, trying to cram it all into one singular cohesive piece. When we let it be what it is, a community library, when we read it, not literally, but literately, (laughs) as literature, as the literature that it is, when we treat it as the jumping off point, the beginning point, the catalyst for revelation rather than the end of revelation. When the Bible is the beginning of the sacred and life-giving conversation rather than the end of it. Because Christianity is generally accepted to rest on this belief that God has been made known to humanity through revelation. God has been revealed, disclosed, And this primarily in the Christian tradition is in two ways. Through Jesus, right? So we say Jesus reveals God. We said last year we did a series on the letter of 1 John. We said Jesus actually isn't the revelation itself. He's the revealer. And the thing he reveals is a way of life, an unconditional way of being. In the gospel of John and in 1 John, it's called eternal life. In the other gospels, it's called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus reveals this. But we're not going to get into that tonight because behind that revelation is the question, how do we even know what Jesus revealed? We weren't there. How is it that we received this revelation thousands of years later on the other side of the planet? That's through the second primary form of revelation, dun, 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 the Bible, right? We only think we know what Jesus revealed because we have this book that says, hey, Jesus revealed this. This is what God is like. And in this book, we've got tons of texts about what Jesus reveals, the traditions from which he emerges, the religions and the empires, the politics and the social realities that existed thousands of years before and hundreds of years after Jesus, the Bible. And for a long time, the Christian tradition has been settled on this simple idea that the Bible is God's revelation to us, revelation being the experience of disclosure, God or truth disclosed, made known to us, the idea being the opposite of concealment. Whatever it is that we think remains mystery, that's all been taken away through revelation. That something of the nature of God has been disclosed to us through this book. Oddly though, this view of revelation and of the Bible as the opposite of concealment actually owes more to the philosophy of the enlightenment, placing God and the Bible in the realm of reason. We can think our way through it than it does to anything the Bible actually says, especially about God. And so the irony is this, the enlightenment thinker, we might think of as like the scientist, rejected the sort of religious superstition of revelation as if something could be made known to us supernaturally. And even though the religious thinker, a priest or a theologian rejected the secularization of the enlightenment, right? Science can't teach us anything. We have everything we need to know in our sacred book. They're at the same time playing the same game. They shared this presupposition, whether it was in the university or in the church, that humans had the capacity to grasp objective truth, universal or what we might call literal truth. Whether this was the painstaking empirical work of the natural scientist, the research of the social scientist, or it's called the hermeneutic approach to the scripture engaged by the theologian, it was believed that by employing pure reason, if we just study it hard enough, untouched by our own prejudice, ha ha, we can decipher the singular meaning of what is being studied, whether that's natural or supernatural. So this is sort of the gift of the enlightenment. But by the end of the 19th century, the idea of neutral examination or pure reason 
was falling apart. It was coming into question. And so we began to notice that ideas like objective or neutral or literal were illusions in and of themselves, learning that we bring ourselves to reason as much as reason brings to us. We bring ourselves to revelation as much as revelation brings to us. Buckle up now. We bring ourselves to the Bible (laughs) as much as the Bible brings to us. So when we make absolute claims concerning what we believe about the world or God or the Bible literally means... (laughs) acting as if our opinions are these results of painstaking, objective, and rational reflection, we're deceiving ourselves. Because our understanding, our very best reading, as literally as we can infer meaning, is always our interpretation of the information given, whether that's the raw material of the world, whether that's the Bible, whether that's Revelation. So it is always affected by what we bring to it. I'll explain this. Uh, I've used this example before, so you may have seen it here. What is this? What is this? Louder. Louder. What is it? Louder. What is it? All right. What's up? I was waiting for the one that I needed. Inevitably, somebody goes, it's just a bunch of lines. Uh, Here's the deal, though. Literally, based on pure reason, it is just a bunch of lines on a piece of paper, right? Or a bunch of digits on a digital screen. But we will either see a rabbit or a duck, not both at the same time, because we are unable to see the lines of the picture devoid of these images. Because we do not see through pure reason. We see through our interpretive frameworks. Or we might say, we don't read through pure literalism. We always read through our interpretive frameworks. In the same way, we never see God or the world as they are. We never read the Bible directly with a purely literal one-to-one revelation, receiving the meaning 100% as it was intended, which is symbolized by the lines on the paper. Instead, we always place meaning onto it symbolized by the duck or the rabbit. So even in daring to read the Bible at all is an admission that we bring all sorts of meaning to the text. C.S. Lewis says we read the text and the text reads us. At some level, what we're laughing at with Ricky Gervais' subtle critique, we're also cringing at because it's so common. That's the way comedy works, right? We're like, oh God, I do that right? Very often we see ourselves and we're horrified, but we laugh so that we don't cry. (laughs) When we believe the rabbit is a rabbit or the duck is a duck and someone points out that they're actually just lines on a page into which we've brought meaning or when the Bible is seen as simple, literal, clear, precise rendering of truth and we learn that it's actually a text that we fill with meaning, Or Isaiah says, it's the same wood that we grew and we chopped down and and the firewood that we used to cook. And it's us who made it the idol. This rocks our world. This unmoors our sense of truth. I remember my first semester at Stetson, I took religion classes and, and I started learning the historical critical approach to biblical scholarship and it rocked my world. I got in this knockdown, drag out fight, shouting match with my professor, Don Musser, about free will and predestination. <laughs> and it was pointed out to me that neither is specifically mentioned nor even heavily alluded to in any direct way in the entire Bible. And I learned that I was trying to argue based not on what the Bible actually said, but on the meaning that I'd been given in youth group and then I had made it my own. And I felt I had to defend the thing that had been given to me that really actually wasn't in the text anywhere that I could find to defend it. And here's the interesting thing. My breakdown wasn't because he could prove one and I could no longer prove the other. I would have been fine with that because I'm happy for a binary switch, right? You prove me wrong, I'll go from this side to this side. It wasn't that he could prove it right and I got proven wrong based on a literal reading that it was a free will duck and not a predestination rabbit. The breakdown came because I faced for the first time that it was neither. It was lines on a page. It was ink on pulp. It was digital letters on a backlit screen. Not a God, not the truth, 
but a wooden carving that I had made with my own hands, a construct. So in this moment of profound wisdom that keeps him in my circle of friends and mentors to this day, he sent me to the counseling center at Stetson <laughs> um, <laughs> to pick up the shattered pieces of, of my certainty and the religious facts about which I was so sure and my airtight literal reading of the Bible. All of these ducks that I had placed in nice rows started to encounter lines and rabbits <laughs> And the fragments of these idle beliefs started to slip away. And this can so often feel like a failure, right? And in many religious contexts, you start to say this kind of thing or ask these kinds of questions, you might be told maybe like you're backsliding into heresy or you're losing your faith. There's all these words and feelings and, and possibilities that seem dangerous to an orthodoxy that's propped up on agreement or compliance or a singularity of meaning. There is only one way to read the text. But this is actually instead the liberating and life-giving work of the way of Jesus in the long tradition of the prophets, which is to deconstruct our own constructs, right? The meanings that we read on to the lines on the page, to deconstruct the systems and the orthodoxies that would vie for our idolatrous allegiance. To lose the illusion of our idols can make us feel disillusioned. <laughs> Trust me. But we don't have to be afraid of it because when we clear the table of the idols that we've created, we make room again for the unpredictable and wild wind of God to continue to blow and to call from within the Bible, but with a voice that is free of the constructs that we've confined it with. And part of the way we clear the table of idolatry each week is to set this table. We practice taking both the aesthetic symbol, the body and the blood, as well as the conceptual frameworks of our best understandings which could so easily become fixed idols of our own making. And each week we break them open and we pour them out. Each week we make them to disappear by consuming them into ourselves. Each week, we remind ourselves that whatever God, whatever truth, whatever revelation are to be found in this tradition and in this community, in this room, are to be found now in and as this community. In the scriptures, it's called the body of Christ. And like our reading of the sacred text and participation in our tradition our practice, when we come to this table, it has to be more than literal. We participate in the Eucharist as the symbol, the symbol of the body and blood of Christ, not the literal body and blood. This, like the more than literal reading of the text, doesn't diminish it. It actually elevates it. It is more than literal. In the Wesleyan tradition, we speak of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, not the literal presence of the flesh and blood, the biological material of a 2,000-year-old homeless dead Jew. That would be odd. And yes, some traditions do believe that and practice it. It may be beautiful in that tradition. We speak of the real presence of Christ, not the literal presence of Christ, which is an invitation to participate in this tradition in a way of being, in the ongoing mystery of revelation and concealment that is known in the presence and harbored in the name of the cosmic Christ. The table of this cosmic universal Christ is set tonight. This table is open, not only to those who read the Bible in a particular way, but to all people. And no one will ever be turned away. When you're ready, feel free to come and grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup.